Hello. Welcome to this uh, Integrated Skills Wider Waste webinar. Um, I'm really glad you've joined us today. Thanks very much for putting it in your diary. And um, we're looking forward to a really interesting hour um, with my two guests today. Um, my name is Stuart Henshaw. I'm Business Development Director at Integrated Skills. And today I'm joined by James Kay, who's Director of Resource Efficiency Wales, and by Lisa Jones, Team Leader in Waste Compliance and Development at Blinder Gwent County Borough Council. Today, we're going to be grappling with that topic of consistent collections. And um, it's good. I'm really looking forward to the topic. I'm really looking forward to the discussion with James and Lisa. We've, we've, uh, we've exchanged a few thoughts so far, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what they've got to say. And uh, I'm going to be quizzing them um, about what they've been doing in Wales. Before we do that, I've got a, a few slides which I, I want to go through and just a little bit of housekeeping, just to say that I've got a few slides and then we'll be having some discussion between the three of us. Um, I think Lisa is just uh, struggling a little bit to get on. Um, when, when she join, joins us, we'll, we'll have the discussion, but first I've got a few slides um, to go through. A little bit of housekeeping, so um, a few slides, discussion, and then we've got Q&A. Um, as we've been doing this for quite a while now, we find that if we leave Q&A right to the end of the session, then um, we've got far more questions than we can actually answer in the last sort of five, 10 minutes. So if you've got a really good question that you want to ask, please just start typing it as we're going through the conversation. We may actually cover it in, in our discussion, in which case you'd be satisfied. If not, we'll actually make a point of identifying it and going through it. And um, I'll, I'll ask uh, James and Lisa to comment on that. Um, so let me, oh, sorry, the other thing to say is we will be recording the session and we'll be sending out a copy to all of you who've registered um, for the session. And uh, James and Lisa and I will uh, have just been uh, talking, exchanging notes about actually just pulling together a little article based on, on the, the webinar and the discussion we have today. So look forward to that and we'll send that and circulate it around once that's, um, once that's ready to go. Okay, let me share my screen and um, I'm just going to go through a few slides and uh, just as a bit of intro introduction to the topic. Um, so the title of today, Wales, third best recycling country in the world. Have consistent collections been the key? Um, these are our two guests. You've not seen Lisa yet. Uh, you've seen James, um, but you'll see Lisa in a few moments. Um, I've got a little advertisement. Um, we run a, a, a monthly webinar. Uh, one In month one, I would do a, a, this wider waste webinar, sort of looking at things that are really outside of the sort of the normal, our normal, um, uh, maybe our client interest, but it's it's just allowing waste managers to sort of put their head up in the midst of busy wor work and actually look at other issues out, maybe outside their direct workload. Um, so we run a, um, a sort of bi-monthly arrangement where I, I host a wider waste webinar in month one and then my colleague Beth Webb will be um, hosting week uh, month two. It's either Beth or, or James Baker, my other colleague. Next date for your diary if you're a client um, and you have RootSmart is uh, our RootSmart masterclass on the 26th of May and we're looking at using RootSmart um, to model services for the government's resources and waste strategy. So we're actually going to be looking at modeling lots of the stuff that we're talking about today. So things like modeling food waste, um, impact on the impact of taking food waste out on the residual and maybe a joint garden and food waste collection. And then looking at the impact of actually, um, if you were to model a chargeable versus a free garden waste service, and I'm going to be talking about that later as, as well with Lisa and James, a, a range of different things, whether you want to change to a, um, if you're still on weekly, if you want to move to a fortnightly or three weekly, four weekly um, collection um, cycle, um, we're going to be talking about how you do that using RootSmart software. That's my advert um, is over. Um, let's get into the topic. I wanted just to, before we, before we start talking about the experience in Wales, I wanted to just back up a second and actually just recap where we're at with the consultation document on consistent, consistent collections. And um, I, I just wanted to pick up um, th this slide particularly, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm picking these out from either the uh, consultation documents, the actual strategy or the consultation documents, but I wanted to just uh, ra raise a thought at this stage. Um, DEFRA says that increasing consistency will reduce uncertainty in the materials that can be collected at curbside. 
okay, we, we I, I agree. Um, with the aims too, and there is two separate quotes here. One is end the confusion for millions of homes and businesses having different collections. Um, and the second one um, in line two, but it says the, the bill will allow us to deliver consistent and frequent recycling collections across England, ending the current postcode lottery. Now, um, a bit of personal, you know, um, work history. I've worked in waste management for over 30 years, 15, well, a handful in um, for Keep Britain Tidy, Tidy Britain Group as it was, and then 15 years in local government, and then the last 15 years have been in consultancy. Neither of those phrases I can necessarily relate to. Um, I'm not sure that that's the problem uh, that we face in trying to deliver um, high levels of recycling. I'm, I'm not sure that the answer is that people, are com millions of homes are confused um, or it's a postcode lottery. I think the real challenge, and we're going to be talking about that today, is actually, you know, ev every authority and every one of you, if you're from local authority, has a system. The challenge surely for, for all local authorities is actually just getting the, the, the public to participate in, in that collection system. Um, you know, maybe maybe this definition of ending confusion and um, you know the postcode lottery thing maybe maybe that has a place but I think it's kind of up towards the the, the marginal gain side of things when we're getting to the sort of levels of, of recycling performance that we're going to be hearing about in Wales but anyway that's just my my thought but I'm just sort of flagging that up because I want to come back to it to it later and see what your thoughts are and a quick bit of history December 2018 the government uh, published its resources and waste strategy um, in May 2019 it put out its first consultation and effectively it was a question of okay what do you want what do you want to do what do you feel that, that consistent collections ought to look like um, and what came back in the, the first consultation document was well okay with consensus food waste seems like a really good thing to have separate food waste collection um, and a separate garden collection of garden waste that could be recycled or composted and then a set of core recycling materials agreed in principle and these are the core materials that that were seem, seem to be agreed in that first consultation document um, glass bottles and containers paper cardboard plastic bottles pots tubs and trays steel and aluminium tins and cans i don't think there's anything that anyone would really want to disagree with there uh, you may in a, in a second lisa and james but I, I i don't think many people would just to bring us a bit nearer up to date, May, and tw May 2021, the government put out its second consultation on uh, consistent collections. And effectively, excuse me if you think I'm oversimplifying this consultation document, but it basically boiled down to a couple of things about garden waste, whether we think it ought to be free or is it, is it possible to continue uh, it being a chargeable service, which a lot of authorities responded in the first consultation and said they would really like to retain the chargeable nature of garden waste. I'm going to be quizzing Lisa a bit later about that. Um, and then the core recycling items, the question was, should we add foil, food, trays, jars, lids, aluminium tubes and, and plastic film? Um, so we're still waiting the response. Um, a government went on the, the, uh, the government website a couple of days ago and, and we're expecting that and have said that the answer to some of those questions and the response to the latest consultation is going to be out in spring this year so well, let's let's um, look forward to that uh, what has come out on the 26th of March is the um, the response to the consultation on EPR extended producer responsibility um, I'm just quote, quoting what it says in the document here but it, you know the government are expecting an interface um, with of, of EPR with the UK government's consistent collections proposal um, and the government believes it's important that local authorities continue to support comprehensive and frequent rubbish and recycling collections to households. I don't think any of us would disagree with that as a as a, a direction. Um, I really I've put this in just to talk about the next bullet point which is about payments. The payment, the funding for these changes are tied up with the EPR and um, I've read a couple of, couple of versions of this. Earlier in the consultation documents, the government was saying that they would fully fund and completely carry the burden of any any additional costs to local authorities, and that would be carried using un, under the EPR scheme. I noticed that the the wording has, has slightly changed under this in the latest statement, which says under the EPR, the government will support the delivery of UK government's proposals for consistent recycling collections. I'm not sure if there's anything meant by that, uh, but anyway, just 
there are, you know, there's a slight difference in the sort of terminology. And then we've heard the recent um, announcement that the EPR implementation is now probably going to be phased in and certainly delayed. It was going to be expected in 2023, but it's not going to be um, delivered until 2024. So there we are, the strategy, government strategy for uh, England uh, and the latest, the latest situation. We're expecting new, more news imminently. So let's go back in time. Let's um, let's cross over. Um, we're now back in Wales in 2009, and uh, publication of a document called One Wales, One Planet, which is Wales' waste strategy uh, for getting to 2050 and zero waste by 2050. Um, within that document in 2009, there was their um, targets, um, a set of mandatory targets, um, which I'll go to and show you in a little bit more detail. But the, the diagram on the right effectively says, look, in 2010, um, our, our behavior is treating the world as if this, we've got three of these planets. Um, we'll be putting in measures to get to 70% recycling by 2025. Effectively, let's assume we've got two planets and uh, then by 2050, we'll be targeting 100% recycling, um, obviously, circular economy and sustainable development and, and acting as if we have just, just the one, which I think is probably the case. Um, we're going to be talking about this um, with James and, and Lisa as, as we go, but I just wanted to flag up um, this important element within the, the, um, the um, One Wales, One Planet document, which is this. It's a set of mandatory um, targets for recycling. Um, uh, you'll see those targets there go from 58% in 2015, 16 up to 70% in 24, 25. Uh, and um, by 2019 and 20, the the document would expect that Welsh authorities would be reaching that 64%. Uh, so how did they do? Um, well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me go back a second to 2011 because it's, it gets better. Um, in 2011, not just were there a set of targets, but there was a document published, which was the collections blueprint, which was really an advisory document on how authorities might meet those targets. Um, I've just, I just thought I'd pick out a page from that collections blueprint document. If, if you've never seen the document, can I suggest that you maybe download a copy and just have a quick look online? Um, it's, it's available online. This is a page that actually is just a simple diagrammatic page, which is talking about residual, the actions within the blueprint for dealing with residual waste. And there's a three, there are three boxes on the left. One is reducing residual waste container capacity, for example, using 140 litre instead of 240 litre, um, or restricting the number of bags that can be put out. Second option is reducing residual waste collection frequency. So once a fortnight is sufficient when weekly food waste collection is provided. And then the third box no side waste collected for residual waste. So how did this all pan out? Well, um, my final slide here before I get into discussion um, with, with Lisa and James is uh, the news about tw the 2019-20 target, the target of 64%. Across Wales, the recycling rate was 65.1%. Uh, the following year, they upped that, the new record high of 65.4%. Um, these four authorities uh, in the next bullet actually have already achieved the 70% recycling target for 24-25. And um, the, um, the, the data, I mean, one of the interesting things is the data shows 18 of the 22 local authorities met the statutory target of 64%. Overall, the target was met, but actually 18 of the 22 met them. Um, and now I believe 20 of the 22. Um, I just wanted to pick out this is this is really just for sort of interest value that Cardiff and Caerphilly, um I've read some things in the in the sort of the local Welsh press about um, Cardiff and Caerphilly about being the worst and second worst. Um, now, just to put this, I just really wanted to put this in context because for those of you who are from English authorities, Caerphilly, um recycled sixty one point nine percent. Which, if you look at the if you look at the league table for for English recycling authorities, are actually seventh best in England. Cardiff um, reached 58% recycling. Um, at 58%, Cardiff is the most successful large city in the UK. And if you actually put it on the same, 
the same list of, of the same English authorities recycling table equate to 23rd, which is um, whichever way you look at, at, at these these stats, they are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, um, you know, whichever way it, it's 20 points higher than the average in England. So my question today um, is, how is that possible? And has it been consistent collections that have actually um, delivered that? Um, but back to just just for those of you who are in, uh, in a Welsh authority or involved in the in the Welsh uh, project, um, um, I, I studied environmental policy and management in the in the 90s, and we talked about setting environmental policy and and how actually you know you you do your best to fix a policy to hopefully get the answer that you want at the end of it. Um, you know, sometimes you can overshoot, sometimes you can undershoot, sometimes you miss it completely. But, um, you know, f for what it's worth, um, you know, and, and no one could ever die through too much encouragement. But I just wanted to, um, you know, congratulate you on on the performance. I mean, it is, it's quite, it's quite phenomenal. And, um, you know, th this is this is sort of rivaling the best best English authorities uh, uh, performance for every Welsh authority. So, um, yeah, this is job well done. And uh, we look forward to finding out how you did it in the next sort of session, the next next part of this um, uh, discussion. So I'm going to I'm going to actually um, introduce James. James, I wondered if you could actually just introduce yourself and, and, and tell us about your role um, within the group that you kind of work with and, and um, we'll, we'll, then we'll hear from Lisa. Yeah, of course, Stuart. Um, thanks so much. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this webinar. I've, I've watched some of your webinars in the past, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, excited to listen to your questions. I'm keeping an eye on the box in the corner of the screen. I haven't seen any questions yet, but if you're obviously the people that are watching, fire your questions into there. If they get too techy, we'll answer them afterwards. If they're nice, yes, no answers, we'll do them on, on, the, on the webinar. So um, do, do get involved, um, everyone listening on there. Um, yes, thank you, Stuart. So my name is James Kay. I'm uh, the director at Resource Efficiency Wells, but my, my, my real job title is the Regional Waste Coordinator. This is a funded position by councils that opt in in Wales um, for a Regional Waste Coordinator. Um, it's a funded position that began in the late 1990s. We're actually in the 25th year and 14 councils um, fund my role. And um, I found it quite interesting actually, Stuart, when, on your slides then, because I hadn't seen your slides um, before. When you put the 2009 uh, slide up about One Wales, One Planet, you know, TZW was being drafted and worked on leading up to being published, published and what have you. Um, I began this role um, um, in April 2010. It was my, it was my job. And um, there were 10 councils that worked in the group there. It's, it's grown to 14, but one of the um, main tasks was getting councils to 52%, which was missed off your slide. That was the 2012, 2013 target, minimum 52. So the, those 09 and 10 days, um, you know, my colleagues across the group, Lisa included, we, we were going, right, we've got to get to 52. <laughs> That's the first. Yeah. That's yeah. the first. Let's put the other ones away for the moment. Let's let's try and get to fifty-two. And you know, it seems um, it only seems like yesterday we were sat in a room. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, quite. Thank you, James. Uh, Lisa, um, and I know you've not got your camera going. I think you might be having some inter internet problems if you have your, your camera yeah around. I have been so I do apologize yeah, no, that's, yeah that's that I haven't fine. got my camera that's fine. on that's absolutely fine so you can hear me that's brilliant and um I wondered if you could just introduce yourself your your waste compliance and development um, team leader at Blind of Gwent but could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and your role yeah, certainly. Um, I've worked in local government now for the last 13 years, mainly within the, the waste team here in Blyna Gwent. I've seen us go from a commingled collection to source separated. We, I was working in the team when we went from weekly collections to fortnightly residual and then to three weekly residual collections. So we've seen quite a lot of changes, you know, through those years that's got us to um, the 64%, which is where we're at at the moment. I think actually we haven't released our figures for this year but we're just at 65 i think impressive impressive yeah big uh, journey mm -hmm. yeah but we'll be he hearing more about that in a second i wondered um james would you just kick us off and and um uh, you know 
I'm, I'm sure that everyone is aware of, of where Wales is. I don't know if we don't need to show a map, uh, but just give us a kind of pen portrait of Wales, what it, it's, its economy, um, kind of, yeah, what, socioeconomic sort of groups. Just give us, fill us in on the yeah, makeup. Of course. Um, so, um... Wales is the is the most beautiful country in the UK. Uh, of course, um, it's a, it's a, <laughs> com, com, comprises twenty two councils. Okay, um, um, uh, there's a, they're all unitary authorities, um, so responsible for collection and disposal. Make makes the uh, counting of uh, waste arisings and the um, recycling rates nice and easy to work out when it's all mm. in one place. Um, a mixture of rural, urban, and valleys councils. Um, I say twenty two councils. Of which I, I work for 14 of them, um, uh, a, a vast mixture of socio-demographic areas, um, um, very, if you like, uh, wealthy and affluent council areas like Pembrokeshire, um, Monmouthshire, Vale of Glamorgan, um, and areas that are extremely socially deprived um, with lots of social problems. Um, um, some of those areas are in the valleys areas and you know lisa i'm sure will again say a few words about um some of the challenges that blind gwent face as um one of the most deprived areas um of the uk and particularly well so um that's pretty much kind of the lay of the land um yeah. are you, do you want to are you going to come into could, you, could you i mean wonder if you could just just um set out for us very quickly just give us again a bit of background on on waste infrastructure um yeah. for, say with for residual waste what what's the situation for residual yeah, primarily um, we don't tend to landfill anymore. I think um, possibly literally in the last month or so, the last landfill sites were not used um, for uh, residual waste. Um, there are two or three councils that have still got operational landfill sites if they need them uh, for those contingency plans. Um, but in, in South Wales, um, there is um, a facility called Trident Park operated by Virador um, under uh, I think it's Project Gwyrith, Project Green it's called. Um, uh, there's a few councils which have signed up to that for residual waste treatment, multi-decade contract. Um, food waste, um, generally there's um, a few AD plants, anaerobic digestion plants um, scattered around Wales. And um, the, you know, the, the plans for those were made 15 years ago, where they would be, what size they would be, which councils would provide feedstock. All that work was done more than a decade ago. Um, dry recycling infrastructure. Um, because there are still some councils that co-mingle, and I will come on to that. Um, so you've got some MRFs um, in Wales. We've still got material recovery facilities operated generally by a council in-house. Um, and we've got lots of transfer stations and lots of mini sorting areas and um, secondary sortation for where councils do lots of curbside sort. Um, but lo lots of local infrastructure, I would, I would say. Yeah, interesting. Well, Lisa, um, could you just add something on the um, something about mixed dry recycling? Um, e each authority is kind of quite autonomous in the way it deals with that. <clears throat> um, could you say a little bit about that? Um, your kind of operation on the spot market and how you you know you're responsible for for really finding markets yourselves. Yeah, certainly. I mean, when when we looked at transitioning from co-mingle to um, source separation, it's not just about the infrastructure that you need at the curbside. We also had to build a bespoke um, waste transfer station because now we're collecting several different materials and keeping them separate. So that was quite a big chunk of the work when we transitioned to source separation was building that um, transfer station. So um, we've got that infrastructure now in place that's where um, our main tip-off points are. And then of course, when we were again, you know, co-mingled authority, we had one contract for the disposal of the, you know, for the collection and disposal. So again, that made the, the work a lot simpler. But then when you're talking about separating the materials at a transfer station, we've got multiple contracts now. So um, one of the key drivers for source separation was good quality recyclate, which had the potential to get us some income. So, um, you know, that and again, something very new to the team that wasn't something that we'd done before. We'd all been, you know, our skills were around disposal contracts, not necessarily marketing materials. So what we've done through the help of RAP is we will have open days at our transfer station and we will invite bidders to come and have a look at our material and to inspect it and have conversations with us and then we invite them to um, to bid for our material 
and then we'll could, enter could just, into could a you contract. Could you just repeat that for us, Lisa? Could you just repeat that? Because I think there's a few people who'd be sort of wanting to hear that one again, actually. So you, you openly invite bidders to come and look at your material to give you a price yeah. on it. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they can <laughs> okay. come and have a look at it. Um, they can come and see it. Um, you know, and they'll give us feedback on that material, and that's reflected then in the price that they offer us for our material. Okay, well, I'm jumping ahead slightly, but I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. But that means that if you go back down the, the chain here, that means actually the public understanding what they need to put out, putting the right materials yes. out, making sure that you've got staff who are really well trained and motivated to actually sort that correctly, etc. It's yes. you know interesting, yeah. Yeah. just 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 the ability to actually say, okay, we're we're making our material public. Um, sorry, we're we're putting on show. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's very very interesting, um, and um, suggested an awful lot of hard work gone in there. <laughs> Yes. And it was a big, you know, it was a steep learning curve for us, as I say, you know, as waste management officers, we tend to, you know, work on disposal contracts. So, so that was something very new to us. And, you know, we, we've learned over time and we've refined the process and we've got more comfortable with it. But, yeah, we 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 invite bidders for our material. Um, could I ask you to give us a bit of a, uh, an introduction to if I if I moved to Blyna Gwent and I started to receive your your the waste collection service wh wh what am I what am I getting and what services mm -hmm. do you provide um yeah you know, well residual um, food mixed dry recycling yeah so it's a three weekly residual collection uh, one of the main drivers for us to be able to offer a three weekly residual collection was to introduce um, an absorbent hygiene product collection at as a weekly collection so that we could remove the offensive waste that was one of the key drivers enabled for, for us to enable us to get our members and our public on board with that although they were already used to having a fortnightly collection we maintained the same bin size that we had at fortnightly um, because we'd only just rolled out those bins so we kept the the, the capacity the same but we reduced the frequency to three weekly so we've got a weekly um, AHP collection we also have a weekly food collection, which is on the same day as your weekly dry waste collection. So that's a, a one path, one lorry that collects all of the materials, food, paper, cardboard, plastics, cans, glass. You can also, on that weekly collection, place out small um, domestic appliances. So we'll take irons, straighteners, hair dryers, you know, radios, things like that. Textiles as well. So if you put some textiles out in a bag, we'll take those on the lorry and also household batteries. So it's quite a significant amount of dry um, recycling that will take a ride. Um, the capacity of residual spin that we've got here is 240. Okay. There are some capsules who are on less, but they may well be offering either a fortnightly collection. Okay, interesting. Could I ask you about garden waste? Um, what do you do on garden waste? How do you provide that service? And um, there's the discussion, obviously, within the within the waste strategy in England here about chargeable versus non-chargeable. Can you give us any thoughts on that? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we've um, we again in the collections blueprint, Welsh government have recommended that you have a chargeable service for green waste because their philosophy is then that it pushes householders and residents to um, home compost. So we've yeah. always had an on-request green waste service. We maintained that, but when we transitioned to the source segregated and the three-weekly residual, we also introduced a chargeable green waste service. And this uh, this meant in Blyna Gwent, I'm not saying this is the same picture across Wales, but but our public um, really didn't like that. It, it wasn't popular, and so they stopped using the service. So our members were quite keen for us to reintroduce free green waste collections, and we we did, and we've gone back to pre-chargeable um, rates now, tonnage that we're collecting. So it didn't work here, but I know that in other local authorities in Wales, I think Monmouthshire have got an annual charge for their green waste and it works for them. So it, I, I think, again, it very much depends on knowing your public and knowing what works for them. And hmm. for us in Blind Grant, the chargeable green waste service didn't work. OK, thank you, James. Um, we're talking about consistent collections um, and we've already flagged up very briefly that actually not all not all authorities in your group actually um, hmm use a curbside sort could you say a little bit about the exceptions to that yeah of course so um 
there's there's 14 councils in the group and there's a mixture of rural urban and valleys um of those 14 you've got seven which are on what you would call the you know the the, the collections blueprint um curbside sortation uh, um, at curb um there are five that are on what we would generally assume to be or call a co-mingle collection whether that's in a wheeled bin or in a, a single use um, bag that's tied up or, or a, a reusable bag and there are a couple of councils on what we call a twin stream collection so just within the group of councils that I'm, I'm helping we've got different systems three three quite different systems and even within those systems um, the twin streams are slightly different you know collection periods and frequencies um, even the curbside sort, the seven on curbside sort, well, they won't collect all of the materials, at least as pointed out, Blind and Gwent pretty much collect everything um, at curbside down to, you know, textiles, batteries and we small electricals. Um, but there's, there's many councils in Wales that do um, curbside sort, but haven't haven't gone to textiles yet, haven't gone to small electricals, haven't gone to we uh, so I haven't gone to batteries and what have you, but that, that will change. Um, but yeah, I guess... There is a mixture, I guess, is what you're getting at, isn't there? You know, we're not so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out what the what the consistent collections element is within these, you know, successful Welsh authorities. And, and so, you know, I'm concluding, well, it's not necessarily just a curbside sort. It's possible to be very successful and actually maintain commingled collections. I think so. I think so. I think um, if you, yeah. Up if to a certain think... point, we don't know what the, you know, the threshold is of that, I guess. You know, we don't know to what percentage that might get you, but... We're, we're getting there, I think. <laughs> I think yeah, we're getting yeah. there. <laughs> I think we're getting there. Yeah. Well, obviously, you are. Um, Lisa, could you say something about um, the sort of socioeconomic makeup of, of the, the council in Blaine Gwent? And, and, you know, you're obviously doing extremely well in communicating and, and getting the message over. What are the challenges um, there for you? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we're we're the smallest uh, local authority in Wales. We have about um, thirty two thousand households, sixty four thousand um, population. We're um, an old a valleys community, old mining community. So very steep hills. The topography is not great for large vehicles. We have to have quite. We've had to have quite a few bespoke vehicles made for us um, to be able to get around very small areas. We've got lots of back lake collection, rose terrace properties, which then affect our green waste rising. Um, it's not. It's not all like that. But we are classed as, as a valleys authority. Um, we've got high levels of deprivation which again you know is is a legacy of the the industrial um elements of the the of the area closing down the steelworks closing down and the mines all going so we've been left with the, the residual of that which is high levels of unemployment economic inactivity high levels of um dependency on state benefits disability allowance you know all the things that you would associate with mm. deprived areas but we can still I, have a 65% recycling rate. Can so I ask you how, how that's how have you always, managed to how have you managed to carry out your communication and, and education? Um, in, in a, it seems like quite a challenging challenging project. Yeah, yeah. How have you managed yeah, to it, communicate? It, it has been. Yeah, and and we we've got all of the. We've got all of the main communication streams that everybody else would have. You know, we 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 communicate with our residents regularly through through leaflets, and we've got our website, social media, all of those. You know, we communicate with. But again, with high levels of deprivation, we've also got um, high levels of adult illiteracy. So we found that the best way to communicate with our public was to actually um, invest in face to face contact. So we employed a team of waste wardens which do a lot of the communication with our public so so if the crews go to a household they've put a contamination tag on the bin because the householder hasn't put the correct item of recycling in the right box that's you know translated back to our waste warden so that they can go and pay the resident a visit so that they can physically explain look at the materials and, and talk it through with them it's labor intensive it's expensive but it works for us here 
Um, our local members are also very keen to have face to face contact with their residents. So they work with us on a number of road shows across across the borough and we'll have certain spots and, and places that we'll go to on perhaps market days so that we will we'll take local members with us and engage with our public, particularly if we're introducing new policies and things. So that's really what's worked again for us here in Blyne Gwent. Obviously it's different. You have to know your public, you have to know what works, yep. you have to know your social demographic and um, you know understanding all of that has helped us to understand how our residents like to be communicated with. So a mix of education and enforcement then? Are you, are you carrying yes, any... yes. Yes, we have started to do enforcement because, you know, we, we got to the point where we felt we've always been carrot before um, stick. And we felt that, I mean, we've been doing this, as James has said, since 2010. So the amount of communication that we've been having with our residents, you know, we eventually got to the point in, I think it was 2018, where we thought, right, we need to start doing some strict enforcement now. Mm -hmm. So we've done um, strict enforcement on side waste. And we've also got policies in place for non-recycling. So even if we visit your house and you you're containing four black bags within your wheeled bin our wardens can have a look inside those bags and if it's showing recycling you know we will issue that household with a section 46 so our enforcement kind of like I say we started with the carrot when we felt we've done enough of that and we've communicated yeah. enough with our residents we've started to do more strict enforcement yeah that's really interesting it kind of um yeah it's, it's ringing a lot of bells that uh, you need to really, you know, you've obviously worked really hard at um, looking at this piece by piece. And that's the, you know, that there's sounds like there's a multi uh, uh, multi component <laughs> response to all of this, the challenge that you've got. Um, it's complex, isn't it? But it sounds like you're actually working extremely hard to um, to to push on a whole range of different fronts to actually get, yeah. get to the, the yeah. Um, the 64 65 percent. Can I ask yeah. about um, your kind of re relationship with crews? Uh, one thing, how, how are you maintaining momentum and um, keeping keeping staff positive who you know maybe find it difficult sometimes? Yeah, and again, that comes down to you know the communication with the crews. They were very clear. James was involved in a lot of the training of our crews right at the beginning when we transitioned, and it was very much you know they they understand how what the what the landscape is like in Wales. They understand mm -hmm. about the statutory recycling targets. You know that's part of our uh, conversation. You know our members are very clear about that. Um, so they understand the drivers. It's also about giving them reg regular feedback. So when we do get good prices for our materials, we regularly feed back to our crews and operatives that it's because of the hard work that they're doing. You know, this is the benefit. This is the payoff. Um, the conversation with our residents is, is is around our performance. So when we're thinking our residents, it's about you know we're high performing and it all because you know what we're doing um, for us and, and how you're helping us achieve our performance. So again, you keep on regularly have regular um, team briefings and toolbox talks so they are aware of our performance that they know. We've got notice board up so that they're aware of, of where we're performing and how we're doing and just keeping that that regular communication going because we don't have we don't have time to sit back on our laurels once you've achieved you know once we achieve the 64 you don't sort of sit down and pat ourselves on the back and say great it's like right how do we get to 70 you know we're because of the statutory recycling targets we're on that journey of continuous improvement we don't have time to stop so we've had to bring the crews with us so they're kind of used to that you know it, it's like it it's constantly changing and moving forward yeah interesting thank you James, um, we've talked quite a lot about targets and um, you know, Lisa just mentioned there that how to sort of manage manage the, um, the, the you know, continuation of pushing for the next target. But just a sort of more general question about targets. Um, you know, lots of English authorities are, 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 you know, in a position where there aren't any, um, any where they've kind of reached their latest target and there, there's nothing to sort of aim for. Just how significant are the mandatory targets you know in that document and and how important have they been to get where you've got at the moment okay yeah good question Stuart um I hope you can hear me it says I've got yes poor internet connection okay, okay good you. um great that'll mean everyone can hear me so um how important are the targets okay um 
I, I, my personal view is they're undoubtedly more important than anything else right now and have been for the last decade. In, in, in Wales, for the last 20 years, we've got clear policy from government, you know, clear theoretical policy that has um, been published, evidence-based, and it's down to councils to, you know, be the practitioners and deliver that those deliver those targets. They've got autonomy; they can decide how they do it, but they must hit the, the, the SRTs. We call them SRTs, statutory recycling targets. It includes obviously reuse and composting, but SRTs for, for sure. Now, um, so in, in some, we know where we're going. The destination is zero waste, 2050. You know, 100% recycling, circular economy. High, job, high levels of jobs, decarbonized. We, we know where we're going, but that journey for councils is down to themselves. And they have that decision to make that. But targets allow the framework for um, conversations to begin, okay? They, they allow the framework for the conversations to begin because you, you have to get comfortable <laughs> having uncomfortable conversations, okay? And this really... I'm in you know, a very luxurious position of, of working for 14 councils, all at different, some are missing the target, some are way above, some are there or thereabouts. Um, some are doing the blueprint, some aren't. Some have had high levels of investment, some have had none. Um, but you have to be confident and assured as a local authority internally, what we're trying to achieve across your staff, communicate well, uh, frontline, operational, um, management, members, etc. before you take that conversation to the public. Because when we take that conversation to the public, we're able to back up why there's lots of service change and why your bin's going to be picked up less frequently or why there's going to be restrictions on black bags or why we're going to introduce this new recycling service because we've got statutory recycling targets to hit. And one crucial thing that none of us have mentioned, and it's really important, Welsh government fine councils for missing those targets. Mm. Okay, the fines are two hundred pounds for every one ton the target is missed by. So, it's a fair mm. um, system in well in in the sense that um, you miss your target by one ton, you pay two hundred pounds. You miss it by x thousand tons, you pay um, x <laughs> x x mm. um, fine. So. But they, they do happen. The fines happen. So it's a, it's a fallacy, again, for perhaps some, some of the audience think, oh, the government don't fine councils when they miss. It, that, that happens. Mm -hmm. So how important have the targets been? Arguably, I've, I mean, I've said it's my view, they are more important than the, the collections blueprint because that shapes how you deliver local services and whether you buy um, super MRF technologies to produce high quality recycler or whether you move to blueprint collection and um, go to source seg and single pass and etc that 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 option is open to councils and different councils will take different paths you can call it the low road or the high road hmm. who's to say which is which to be honest when we look back maybe we'll have more of an idea but you know we, we've got an agreed destination and we're all trying to get to the same place and we're allowed to do it the way we want to targets are interesting yeah no that's a really good point i mean uh, yes i mean i, I think we're gonna we definitely definitely need to uh, focus on that in in if we're going to write write the, a piece on this theme i think that needs to be in there doesn't it that the importance of 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 targets and you know how would you how where would you sort of compare those in terms of this idea of in the the document about just the moment of you know realization that that residents might have that they understand finally what all the materials are that they should be putting out i mean i i, I just i just think as from what you're saying there targets are so much more important that if, if the government uk government you know wants to move this forward then really it, it would set out a really ambitious set of targets to get to 2050 and one thing i'd just quickly add because i know you've got more questions is in wales um Natural Resources Wales, the regulator, they are so hot on what happens to waste, you know, the question 100 end destinations that Lisa and her team have got a report for Blind and Gwent and the other, you know, we're really hot on where our waste goes. And we have a website called My Recycling Wales, which which gives you all the information to the public. So if you want to know where your plasterboard goes in Monmouthshire, go on the website, it tells you. You know, if you want to know where your aluminium cans go in Blind and Gwent, go on the website, it tells you. So this is public information. 
we use that on our websites as well and it's this transparency for the public you know where you know we're trying to do this because we want to get to a certain level of environment and one and a one Wales one planet place so let's let's have let's fund this infrastructure let's fund collections let's train people let's have those conversations but yeah tell the full story make it transparent where the stuff ends up you know because um it's um it's hard to get buy-in if you're faced with someone who just says yeah but it all goes to the far east doesn't it you know yeah. come on come on this is this is this is back in you know this is a long time ago we were having these conversations but you know this is part of our responsibility as um you know resource managers to 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 educate raise awareness increase levels of understanding and change attitudes and behaviors because hmm. we're not done yet and um, we've got a lot of work to do no 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 <laughs> understand that lisa i wanted to ask you a bit a bit about that you know you, you've you've reached um 65 obviously 70 is is in your in your view um mm -hmm. uh, you know what what are you thinking about to get to 70 percent? what are the next um steps that you need to take to get there do you think yeah um well, we've got our own waste strategy, so we're looking to review that to see if there's anything else that we need to be doing. I mean, obviously, as I explained earlier, we're already collecting quite a lot of the materials uh, on a weekly basis and at curbside. And we've also got quite comprehensive services at our household waste recycling centres. We also off, um, have a <clears throat> excuse me, black bag sorting policy as well our our recycling sites so you know we, we're pretty much doing everything we feel that we can be doing plus we've got our enforcement team out as well so the the next steps for us to get us from that 65 to 70 are going to be quite key and quite crucial because um you know there's there's nothing different that we can do or offer so we've um looked at maybe looking at doing a trial for reduced residual capacity because um, as i said earlier we had 240 bins so we're looking at perhaps keeping it three weekly but trying um 180 liter bins or even looking at a four weekly or monthly collection with our 240 litre bins. But we will want to do some trials um, for those first. We've had to put those plans on hold because of the low collections, but that's the sort of conversations we'll be having with the new members to see if there's any appetite for, for that um, after tomorrow. So um, that's one thing that we've looked at. We'll, we're also beyond recycling, as, as indicated, they want to start looking at plastic film curbside. So we revolved a trial in that. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's plastic film. We know it there in that bag. But in terms of waste based targets, it's not going to achieve an awful lot for us. Um, we know that Welsh Government are perhaps looking at um, carbon targets rather than carbon reduction targets, rather than waste based targets, but weight based targets. Sorry. So we're not quite sure when that's going to come in. Uh, and again, Build Recycling has looked at you know flipping the uh, waste hierarchy. We've spent a lot of time looking at mm. you know the residual and the recycling element, and they're refocusing Welsh Government that that onto reuse and repair. So we're looking at establishing a reuse and repair network across Blyna Gwent, and you know there's there's quite a lot of that. Again, that's backed up with quite a lot of funding from Welsh Government in terms of circular economy. So there are some things that we can do. We're also involved in the National Waste Composition Analysis. Um, again, so we've just our spring um, our spring waste has been done, our autumn waste will be done, and we can have a look and see actually what is still left in there. Um, I mean, I you know, I was I was telling James if I go and visit our waste transfer station and you listen to the lorries tip off, you can still hear some glass in there. So we know that uh, there are really? still you know households mm. that aren't that aren't doing everything that they could be doing. So you know we'll have to keep on top of the enforcement. We've also introduced um, a trade waste service, which is mm. in line with our curbside service. So we were offering a commingled service for trades. So we were running the two services. So we've recently transitioned to a curbside sort for our tradeway service as well so it's getting harder it really is getting harder to get to you know we we thought 52 percent was a challenge we then went to 58 um and we thought 64 was a challenge we were you know super over the moon to to, to achieve that but 70 percent is going to be really difficult 
Well, I mean, if it, if it puts this in perspective, I remember when I first started in, in local government waste management, and we were we were struggling and thinking about how we we're going to get to seven percent. Mm. <laughs> um, and now, uh, you know, I'm I'm having to pinch myself that I'm having this conversation about you know getting beyond seventy percent, which which no one at that yeah. you know in that time just after two thousand was actually talking about really seriously anyone getting to seventy percent. So. Um, I mean, you're already on that journey. You're, you're doing incredibly well. I'm sure people listening in have, can't fail to be impressed with what's been done so far. Um, this is a bit of a ridiculous question, I know, but have you any thoughts on the sort of 80% um, and getting, you know, you've, you've, we've obviously got a target in there. You've given yourselves a target of 100 um, in 28 years. Um, you know, have you any thoughts on 80%? What does it look like? Um, what about infrastructure, James? You know, have you any thoughts on kind of... Um, yeah, what it, what it will need to look like to get to to uh, eighty and then beyond. Um, yes. Okay. So um, an eighty percent target was um, publicly talked about um, well, uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago, but we don't have anything on um, on legislation yet. So it's been discussed in forums and um, meetings or whatever, but there's nothing yet. So we don't know when it's going to come in, but we know it will. Crikey, what's what's it going to look like? Right, one of the one of the things you've got to, I think, understand is if we're going to get to zero waste, that assumes we're going to recycle and reuse one hundred percent of everything. Now, we know that there are elements of household waste that we cannot recycle or reuse. So, arguably, you know, quite re realistically there is a limit already hmm. in 2022 what we can get to and we you know i don't know maybe maybe if we did um full reuse and recycling we might get to 86 percent. i don't know i'm just pulling a number out there but in in practice that's not going to happen i you know we need we need to understand um if we stick with weight-based targets, which are out of date and old-fashioned, then we should definitely get rid of them. But if we assume we're going to stick with them, we need to have these perhaps perhaps these uh, uncomfortable conversations with Welsh government about you know if we can't recycle carpet, then can we take it out? You know if we can't recycle polystyrene, can we take it out? If we can't recycle nappies, can we take it out? You know because why, why judge us on something that we can't recycle? Because we won't get there, will we? So you know, it's it's a tricky one. Um, I it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Um, you know, I, st I still I still I feel quite strongly that um, participation is a real key thing across different councils, different regions of councils, and as a whole, you know, we can get you know hundred percent of the people recycling ninety percent of the materials eighty percent of the time. Yeah. Or, or or change the um, yes. um, information in there and you still get the same result. And um, we don't know as local authority managers where we currently sit with that. Um, so it's knowing it's knowing your knowing the dynam the, the 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 fluid dynamics of compositions of waste. But we're very lucky in Wales, as Lisa said. Welsh government pay for councils to have their curbside and household waste. Um, um material streams r reasonably regularly evaluated i mean it's, it's 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 embarrassing that we have this luxury of um data um that other countries don't have but that that allows us to then um develop services that fit the composition of wastes hmm. you know thank um, you um lisa any any further thoughts on the 80 percent figure I, I think it comes back to a lot of what Joseph said. I mean, it's going to be about analysing our participation, um, looking at, you know, looking at the what's still in the black bag waste. Is there more that we can do in terms of participation? But also we need to rely on, you know, pressure from, from government. And we know that the pressure from the public has helped with actually, you know, let's get rid of those hard to recycle materials in the first place. Instead of, you know, yeah. we're, we're being dealt the blow with the fines yeah. if we don't meet the targets. But actually, you know, we're dealing with a lot of products that are put on the market that we just can't deal with. Mm. So, you know, it, it's about having those, you know, having those conversations from government about, you know, putting pressure on the, on the producers. So, uh, and we know that, and, 
you know, Welsh Government are quite hot on um, extended producer responsibility as well and putting the financial onus back on those companies that are producing those materials. So they are offering us that support. Um, in terms of 80%, I mean, our lorries at the moment are struggling with the capacity at the curbside. So, you know, are we looking at uh, greater numbers of lorries on the road to collect that amount? You know, because going from 65% up to 80, we're still looking at considerable amounts at curbside. Um, the pandemic changed a lot of behaviour at home. So we're seeing, you know, the composition at curbside has changed when we've seen things being relaxed and released those um, buying habits have stayed so we're picking up a lot more cardboard now than we used to we know that the plastic effect has, has also meant that producers are you know packaging using cardboard packaging now as opposed to plastic because it's seen as as more environmentally friendly from a from a buying perspective so you, you know, the vehicles that we've got now and the compartments can't cope with what we've got at curbside now. So are we looking at, you know, different vehicles, greater vehicles, a second pass? You know, is the first pass now now gone? So, you know, all these things we'll, we'll have to sort of take into account. We've also got DRS on the horizon mm. as well, which again is going to change the composition at curbside. Is it going to reduce it at curbside? We're not sure. Um, is it going to affect the quality of what we're collecting at curbside again we're not sure so you know there's all these things that again welsh government will have to take into account as as well as local authorities because you know as as we know things change and we have to develop and move with that so it might be as james has said we we have to reflect on those weight based targets because they're no longer fit for purpose yes yeah. But can I jump in on that, Stuart? Just before you Please move do. on, um, some of the um, some of the materials that you can reasonably guess still are in the black bag at curbside um, that we'll know that, that are definitely in there when we when the compositional analysis is finished are things like textiles and small electricals and batteries. You know, and we know the problems that you know vehicle fires and what have you can um, across the regional group I work for. We've we've got. Um, two regional contracts, one's for we and batteries, one's for textiles and media. And they're, they're the biggest UK multi-local authority um, recycling contracts. And Blind, Blind and Gwent lead on the, um, the we and the batteries. And they're primarily household waste site materials, you know, where, where people, civic amenity sites, perhaps in England they're called, where people take materials to deposit. But um, uh, more, more recently in the last year or two, we've got elements of that which include curbside now as part of the contract. So um, we've got suppliers in place now that provide services that we're going to take them on a journey now because they need to understand how to collect textiles and we and batteries at curbside efficiently, safety, safely, sorry, um, in, in a timely manner, it, what the frequencies are and um, where it needs to go. You know, we're, we're working that out. I guess it goes back to we're practitioners, so we're going to work that out as a group of councils and we'll share feedback across the group what work. And something that we've not talked about at all is across the group we talk about things when things go wrong okay we share failure and um i'm not going to ask lisa to tell what the best failure is in line of that's, that is un, that's unfair of me um, but across the group of councils when things go wrong we, we we've got the camaraderie and the and the comfort to tell each other, hey, we tried this and it didn't work. <laughs> and that's really important. Um, we're a small country, lots of councils, but we've all we're all going to the same place. So we we've got to talk to one another and, and we do that quite effectively. Very good. Um I just wonder, folks, I, I know there are there are quite a few questions that have come in. I, I'm just gonna propose that actually um, if you're comfortable with this, James and Lisa, that we actually just go through and we, we do an email response and we can circulate our responses on the questions. I just wondered, we've only got, well, we've got no minutes left yet, but I just wondered if you, if both of you really appreciate your time and, and um, your insight. And the discussion today has been really interesting for me. I hope for those of you who joined the webinar, but um, if you had one sort of free, just a, a, a free bit of advice, what, what's your what's your kind of um, you, what's your gem that you'd, you'd share with people on the webinar today about how you got where you got? Mm -hmm. Go on, Lisa. Lisa. Go on, Lisa. Oh, has she dropped off? Yeah, she might. Lisa. 
Walker, James. Uh, okay, I'll go. Okay, so for me, one gem. I think it might surprise people, but what I would do um, in your council right now, I would examine and just inspect what you're doing with residual waste, how often it's collected, how it's collected. Do you have an enforcement policy? Is it actually enforced? And what happens when the public don't comply with it? Okay, those, those are the kind of steps. If you begin to look in those areas, you can you can clear direction. Yes, I think you, you've got to have you've got to have clear direction about where it is you want to go. Good response. I? I like it. Yep, that's great. Thanks, James, Lisa. That has been such a good hour. Uh, it's flown past. Um, I really appreciate your time and um, yeah, thinking about these questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for actually joining us. We will go through the, your questions here. We'll we'll provide an email response. We'll circulate that round with a with a you know, bonus video of this um, of this webinar as well, and look out for an article on on the subject. Really appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you very much, and um, yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.